Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Cass, for that introduction. And uh, yeah, it's entirely appropriate that uh, we've just shared uh, communion, the Lord's Supper together, and that'll become a bit more apparent in a few moments' time. It's great to be uh, here again at the uh, Christian Family Centre at Seton. Um, and uh, uh, it occurred to me this week uh, when we were preparing to come here that it's 20 years ago this year uh, that uh, Judy and I and uh, Josh and Em walked through the doors at the Christian Family Centre here at Seton. Josh was four and Emily was two. Uh, so uh, there you go, Em, a, a bub story already. Uh, and you didn't give permission for that one. There's another one coming that I haven't told you about either. But, um, and it's great that there, Josh and Emma are still here. Josh is interstate this week. Em's in the front row sitting next to Jude. And uh, uh, it was just uh, fantastic to be there. It's been a great journey. Uh, as uh, Cass said, uh, Judy and I headed up to the Hills Christian Family Centre uh, a couple of years ago that this church planted uh, also uh, 20 years ago next February. Uh, in that time, there's been uh, five baptisms and ten baby dedications. Uh, so the church is growing, uh, you know, from both ends, <laughs> uh, you might say. And uh, two more baby dedications in the wings with uh, another one coming in the oven in the weeks to come. So that's uh, very productive up there in the hills, uh, which is wonderful. It's good to hear. But uh, I've been asked to speak about the authority of God's word. It's a, it's a, a real, um, uh, oh, I guess, something that's really dear to my heart because I've seen its power outworked in my life and, and obviously is outworked through um, the life of the church and, and God's creation as we know it. And uh, the context that uh, we've been talking about these things this month is the, the 500th anniversary of the Reformation when Martin Luther uh, spoke about uh, some things that uh, he felt were needed in terms of reforms in the church. And uh, one of those things was uh, the idea that every follower of Jesus could uh, access and read uh, and use and understand the Bible. Uh, that at that time, it was, a, it was uh, communicated most often in Latin. Uh, it, there was no idea or expectation that all followers of Jesus would read the Bible. It was left into the hands of uh, the, the uh, pastorate. And, uh, you know, the idea that, that you could access and read the Word of God was, was really not even spoken about or conceived of. Some might have even thought it was dangerous and, you know, it wasn't encouraged at all. But as you'd be aware, if you've been around this place for any length of time, uh, we are the beneficiaries of the fact that everyone is encouraged to read God's Word, to read the Bible. And uh, we have a reading plan uh, here at the Christian Family Centre that we use up in the hills as well. You can access it through your mobile phone. You can get into the Word of God any way you like. And uh, that's really important and it's really uh, uh, it has a great impact on our lives as we submit ourselves to that. Now, the temptation might be, as you listen to that, is saying, okay, he's begun his message by saying, read the Bible. Fantastic. You've worked on that one for a long time. That's insightful. But what I want to do today is try to build uh, a picture, if you like, and really communicate something that we are actually talking about more than reading a book. Uh, that... Um, when it comes to the authority of God's word, we're not talking about, oh, there's some good ideas in these pages, even though that's true, but we're talking about something that's far bigger and far more expansive than that. And I believe that all of us here this morning have to um, go on a journey today where we need to walk out of here with a greater sense of the activity of the authority of the word of God in our lives, in our church, in our world, in our community. And we also have to understand not only how that impacts upon us, but also how we are invited to participate in the authority of God's Word. Amen. That God incredibly, mercifully says, here is, if you like, the authority of my Word, and you as my child as my son or my daughter, are invited to exercise my authority on my behalf through my word. 
And, and, and it's this incredible picture that even through the sense of just being able to talk, which sometimes, you know, we maybe have mixed feelings about talking, I've managed to make a career twice out of it, and, and I'm, I'm happy about that. It's fed me for a long time, praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Some of us like to talk liberally as well, uh, others not so much. Uh, I do enough talking for both my wife and I, which she's happy about because she's not a big talker, uh, even though she can communicate well to two- and three-year-olds, as Cass has already said. So uh, this talking thing that we do, which is we take for granted, it's just something that occurs all the time. God actually, it's, it's, a, it's a really special thing. Uh, it's a gift of God that's given to us, and our words have great power and authority in God's sight to do stuff. <laughs> and that's what we're going to talk about here today. I want to introduce this by looking at Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, which says, The word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. And just leaving that up there for a moment and looking at that final statement, it reveals one of the ministries of the Word of God. You might have thought, oh, they tell us to read the Bible so we can get more information in our heads. Only partially. Because we're expecting that as you read the Word of God, that happens. And as you thought, well, you know, this is how I think it ought to be and this is what I think I ought to do and this is how I ought to think, God says, I'd like to speak to that now. I'd like to assess that. And as you submit that idea to me, I'd actually even like to pass judgment on it in the very nicest way and find out whether it's wanting in my eyes or not. So the reading of the scriptures is a spiritual experience. It's active and alive. Who likes to feel alive? Well, engage with the Word of God because it's coming at you active and alive. According to the Bible, the Word of God is actually Jesus. It's actually Jesus. We read at the start of John's Gospel, it says, In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And they're not talking about the Bible. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. Interesting start. To help us out a little further, a few verses later, it says, The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. The Bible definitely contains the words of God. It contains the story and the testimony about the word of God, who is Jesus. Lo and behold, God's word is actually a person who then we experience today by the power of the Holy Spirit. So when we think, well, I can control the word of God. It's not going to affect me if I don't open it. You know, I can just put it there, keep it safe. But you can't tie that thing down. <laughs> because through God's Spirit, it's reaching out to you even now as it's preached over you. You thought you were coming to church to just hear another message, to just get another coffee from Char, or whatever. But God actually said, prepare to meet your maker. <laughs> and by God's grace, no one's departing from us now. But, but the Spirit is now uh, judging and assessing and, and, and refining you as the word is preached over you. Now, one of the great legacies, as I said earlier, of Martin Luther is this doesn't have to be restricted to Sunday. It shouldn't be just respect, restricted to Sunday because every time we open this, we pick up the tool of the Holy Spirit the story of the living word is, be, is exposed before us and God reaches through it and takes hold of us and says, we are now going to do business. I am now going to uh, impact you. I'm going to form you. In fact, the creating act of God continues in you when you open these pages. The creating act of God began 
with God speaking. It's an incredible thought that the power of a word out of the mouth of the living God set this in motion. What we are doing today in many different levels. Firstly, just when we were born. Just when life came and humans were made and we had this ability to relate to each other, be with each other, talk to each other, that came out of the living word of God. Let's read about it now at the start of Genesis. It's the bookend of John chapter 1, which starts with the words in beginning. He was picking up on this, which is when God said, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. So we know that the Spirit of God was there. John just told us that the Word of God, Jesus, was there. And the start of verse 3 starts with, And God said, Let there be light. And sets in motion the wonder of creation, the majesty of the world and the universe that we live in, and God speaks it into existence. Now, I've got good news for you today. I hope this is good news. God has not finished speaking. God has not finished speaking. He continues to work through his creation, but he also wants to work in you who are part of his creation. And God hasn't finished with you. You might think, well, I've reached this point or I've reached that point or, you know, I can't see my way forward. I'm not sure what's going to happen next. Don't know what to do. As though the creative process in you is finished. It has not. God wants you to be open and exposed and cooperating with the creative process that's going on in you. Now you're thinking, Pastor, okay, sounds exciting. What does it look like? It's one of the reasons why we say, when we become Christians, when we say yes to Jesus, we're born again. Creation has occurred again in you. And that doesn't end there, but as we submit to the Spirit of God and follow Jesus, we are being created. Now, I don't know about you, but I hope the creation process hasn't finished in me. I have a great sense that there's more work to be done inside and out. And so when we adopt the discipline or the process of coming to church and exposing ourselves to the scriptures, it's not just reading for information's sake, but the creative process takes another step in you. And friends, we want to say, who wants to be exposed to that? Who wants that process to occur in them? We're called to participate in it both through ourselves and through others. We also see in the scriptures that God speaks through his creation. The heavens declare the glory of God and the skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they reveal knowledge. They have no speech, they use no words. No sound is heard from them, yet their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. The speech of God is God constant it's ongoing someone once said that God is continually communicating and the challenge for us is to tune in to what's being said that's part of the process that occurs when we listen to preaching or when we do when we submit ourselves to a devotional reading process that's what's going on there so God speaks through his creation we also see that God's word will accomplish its purposes that God speaks with the idea that things are going to happen when he does it. It says in uh, Isaiah chapter 55, which we're reading at the moment in our devotional readings, as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose of for which I sent it. God's quite optimistic and faith-filled about his own word. (laughs) He's expecting when he sends it out for it to achieve something. And many of you are the beneficiary of having the word of God spoken over you. I'm assuming you're here because in some way God's word has had an effect on you. 
You've responded to it. You've heard about it. Some of you might be here by invitation and may not be thinking about it in that way. But in that sense, God's word through someone else has reached out to you. That simple act of, would you like to come to church or, you know, we're doing this or whatever, and you've responded. That's even God's word being outworked for that person because God has said, share the good news with others and invite others, as Cass was indicating earlier. And finally, other indicators about the strength of God's word are in Psalm 119, which says, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. And God says, I will not violate my covenant or alter what my lips have uttered. So we've spent our time so far talking about the strength of God's word, but what about your words? And now some of you think, hang on a minute, we've just changed lanes. (laughs) I mean, it's not too hard for us to think about the word of God being powerful and dramatic and achieving things, but we don't often associate the same power with ours, and in some sense that's right, but we do know if we think about it, the impact of our own words that they can have. Sometimes we forget about it, sometimes we're a bit reckless with it, but God is actually well aware of that power and he wants the impact and the power of our own words to be used wisely and for good effect. It's not unnatural that we would expect ourselves as children of God to speak like our Father. I had an interesting situation a few weeks ago uh, where I was sitting in the kitchen on a Saturday morning and um, there, uh, the girls were off sleeping in their rooms or they weren't there with me and I heard this cough, someone clearing their throat and I thought, oh, that's Jude. Um, she must be awake. <laughs> and then I thought, and I said, hang on, that sounds quite a young cough. It's, it just doesn't... Sorry, Jude. It's, it was... <laughs> I couldn't make it out because it sounded young, but it sounded like Jude. And then I got up and stood and I realised, in fact, it was Emily coughing and clearing her throat. And I was caught by the fact that she did it in exactly the same tone and way as her mother did. And as I was preparing this message, I remembered that because it threw me because I mistook who it was. And I realised that there's something going on when it's not unusual for children to imitate the way that their parents speak, sometimes for the good, sometimes for the bad. That whether it's genetic or, or, you know, adopted because we lived together for so long, don't know. But for us, it's natural when we have our Heavenly Father to speak like He does. We should adopt His words and not the words of the enemy, the father of lies. That's not who we speak like. So I want to encourage you today to think about where, what your words reflect when you speak, when you communicate, when you talk to other people. I remember God challenged me uh, about five years ago and, and really he actually said to me, I felt this sense that he wanted that year to be a year of faith-filled thought, speech and prayer. And uh, I realised that after going through a challenging time, that it affected my thinking, which had affected my speech, which then affected me and affected others. And God was saying, son, I don't like what's coming out of your mouth. I'm not happy with the speech that I'm hearing. It doesn't reflect who I am, who you are, and the commission that you've been given. And we all need to take that stock take, and I'm inviting you to take it right now, about how your speech as a follower of Jesus reflects who your heavenly Father is and what he said about you. Because we need to make sure that it matches up with who we are and what God has said about us. We're given this invitation uh, or this command in Proverbs chapter 4 and it's written as a father talking to a son, but it could be our heavenly Father talking to us. It says, my son, pay attention to what I say. Turn your ear to my words. Do not let them out of your sight. Keep them within your heart, for they are life to those who find them and health to one's whole body. Above, else, above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. Keep your mouth free from perversity and keep corrupt talk from your lips. It's a warning. It's an invitation 
to be careful, to pay attention, to pay attention to God's words and also keep guard on our own heart in terms of what comes after it. Now this ministry of speaking was put into, uh, was framed for us by some amazing promises that Jesus made while he was on earth. And as we read uh, what Jesus said about the ability of our words as, of, as followers of him to have an impact, when you read it, you think, Lord, perhaps you should have dialed that down a bit. Because it just seems, it's just like, it almost seems dangerous to say it. Jesus said, Mark chapter 11, verse 23, Truly I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea, and does not doubt in their heart, but believes that what they say will happen, it will be done for them. That's an incredible statement. It's an incredible uh, promise. Uh, what are we supposed to do that? He applies it to anyone and invites this invitation. Now, was Jesus expecting that the church would go into the earth-moving business? Well, I mean, maybe sometimes that's what's required. But he seems to be saying that this sense of speaking to have a dramatic impact on situations and circumstances is, is normal for the kingdom of God. He goes on in Matthew chapter uh, 17 uh, to say it in a similar way. Again, the mountain pops up. Truly, I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. That's an incredible promise. Do we believe that and understand that? How do we appropriate this power that we've been given as followers of Jesus? What do we do with it? How do we use it? Jesus then introduced uh, the concept of binding and loosing. Now, some of you are thinking, what are you talking about? Are you making books? Uh, help us with this. But Jesus made a promise that he repeated later in the gospel, which really I want to invite you to step into today. Jesus said, I will give you the kingdom, the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Some of you would be aware of the tradition when people turn 21. It's almost lost these days. But they get given a, a, car, a, a card that's shaped in a key. Does anyone remember that here? Does anyone still do that? Can you still buy keys there must be some people looking at that and go, what's with the key? Now, you'd remember, those of you, perhaps my age and older, that, well, I was, anyway, don't worry about it. I'm closer to 100 now than I was last year. Does that make sense? Anyway, doesn't matter. Um, it doesn't, actually. But, so the key and 21... It comes from the idea that when a, a child turned 21, firstly, in many jurisdictions at that time, they had the legal power to do things like vote and drink, still is in some places today, drive, I think, and, of course, it was a tradition that the parent gave the child a key to their house. And there was this sense of... Uh, you know, you are now of a legal age of responsibility. You have the permission to come and go when you please because you've reached this matter in time. So here, Jesus incredibly says to his followers, I've given you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And it's just like, that's unbelievable. We, we have this sense of authority almost to decide, if you like, when we come and go, and perhaps who else does around us? It's an incredible responsibility and, and, and gift. And he goes on to say, whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. We often think that all of the powerful spiritual activity is going on in heaven, and we're just fumbling around here trying to pick up the scraps and wire something together. But Jesus says... The authority of that influence rests here on earth. The binding and the loosing power is here. And I want to ask you, 
Have you done any binding or loosing lately? What have you bound and loosed in recent days or weeks or months? How have you used the authority that Jesus has given you in the kingdom of heaven? Now, just in case we see this scripture and we think, oh, I'm not sure what he says. Maybe you made a mistake. We'll just move on. Matthew chapter 18, Jesus repeats it and expands on it. Truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. There it is again. Again, truly, I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything that they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three gather in my name, there am I with them. I call it a biblical quorum. Some of you in associations or in corporations know that to have a meeting that's got authority, there's got to be a certain amount of people there or a certain amount of members there. It's pretty easy in the kingdom. Two will do. <laughs> Just one more other than you. And Jesus says, I am there. And then he says this incredible promise just agree on something and it's done. And we often underestimate this and, and, and we miss it. And I'm just inviting you now to think about the concept of binding and loosing and of praying with someone in agreement. Those of you who are married or live with other people, you've got a very privileged position. We're used to this idea of doing these private devotionals but occasionally, probably more so than that, grab someone and say, would you agree with me on this? Would you believe with me for this to occur, for this person, this circumstance, this thing, whatever? And because we have the power of agreement that's been given to us in prayer. And we have this power when it comes to binding and loosing. Now, I'm not talking about, you know, uh, you know, I... I you know, I'm, I'm, I'm losing four packets of marshmallows. Uh, into, you know, I'm not talking about stupid stuff. I'm talking about, you know, stuff that flows with the mission and the ministry of God. I bet you there are things that you've complained about. I bet you there are things that you are lamenting about, that you are anxious about, that you are despairing over. And I ask you, have you done any binding or loosing about those things as well? Because we're all very quick sometimes to say, I wish that wasn't like that. I, I, I'm just, you know, I wish that person was whatever. But have you spoken God's love and grace and mercy over that person at the same time that you've bound the activity of the enemy in their life at the same time? Friends, we need to contemplate that. In fact, I think we should occasionally have a binding and loosing party. Have you ever been invited to one of those? Please come to my binding and loosing party. I mean, I think of what are we, basket weaving, binding, what is that? Books? Come on. No. It's an invitation by Jesus to pick up his word and to use it with authority. I want to ask you a couple of questions and then we're going to move towards a time of prayer ministry. I really felt this morning that... There are some people here, I'm sure that all of us in some way need to be aware of this authority in prayer, the power of our words that have been given to us by our Creator, by our Heavenly Father. And the great privilege that we have here at church every week, I love our tradition where we don't just preach the word and disappear, but we then open up the front and say, if you want to receive prayer... Come out the front and we can pray for your situation or this thing right now. And you might think, well, that's very nice. Pastor Phil and Pastor Cass are out the front. I walk out. Someone prays for me. It seems to go all right. I go back. But you don't understand, according to Scripture, what's going on. You're having an agreement with someone over a circumstance on the authority of Jesus by his invitation. You, the difference between you doing it on your own, it's, diff, it's different in some way. Jesus is there in a different sense when we're with others. He's with us now in a different sense than when we're on our own. And so this time of prayer ministry 
is when things can really take hold in terms of our situation. I want to ask you two questions. We'll look at the first one. Firstly, has your awareness of and engagement with the authority of God's word and it's his power to change become a little dull? I want you to let that sit there for a minute and think about how you engage with the words that God has spoken. In what sense are you aware of them? How have the promises of God impacted upon you recently? In what way are they outworking themselves in your life? Do you know what they are? Have you exposed yourself to them recently? In what way do you engage with them? God wants his authority and his power to be residing in you strongly. Have we let that slip a bit? Have we let that become dull a bit? Have we disengaged with this? Someone said to me recently, I find the Bible boring. As though it was the Bible's problem. <laughs> well, how is it boring? You know, where's the power then? Where's the openness and the exposure to the power? The Bible is literally on fire. The Bible is cutting and dividing and assessing and moving it's alive and active in the hands of the holy spirit second question that we're putting up on the screen has your awareness of an engagement with the authority of your words and their power to change become a little dull Maybe you, you have a strong sense and respect for God's word. Maybe you understand its authority, but you've lost touch a little bit with the power that you have in prayer, with the, the power that you've been invited to participate in and use, not simply on your own behalf, although I suggest you do that, but also on others' behalf, friends, family, neighbours, community, your church, your pastors, your leaders. How have you failed or, or forgotten to let that authority and use that power that's within you? I invite you to reflect on that today and to ask yourself how you can be using that. I want to finish with some encouragements just quickly from the scriptures. It says in Proverbs chapter 18, words kill, words give life. They're either poison or fruit. You choose. Wow. Wow. We read in Ephesians, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Jesus said, Luke chapter 6, a good person brings good things out of the good stored up in their heart, and an evil one brings evil things out of the evil stored up in their heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of, what is your heart full of. And then finally, consequently, faith comes through hearing the message and the message is heard through the word about Christ. How are we contributing and helping others to grow in faith? That is the challenge before us today. Let's close our eyes and pray.